Hey, everybody out there. I am so sad that we can't be together uh, uh, all squeezed in in a room, all sweaty and gross in San Diego, but this is the next best thing. We are so happy to bring you the San Diego Comic-Con at Home panel with a cast of a new HBO show that I know a lot of people are going to be talking about when it premieres August 16th. It is Lovecraft Country, and we are here with the cast today. We have stars Journey Smollett, Jonathan Majors, Michael K. Williams, Anjanu Ellis, Abby Lee, Wumi Mistako, and Courtney B. Vance. Thank you all so much for being here today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having um, me. I would like to know who wants to volunteer to explain the premise of the show. Journey. Or if you would like me to try and do it. <laughs> Journey small. Anybody? I think I want to do it. Journey, go for it. Um, it is a new drama from HBO um, called Lovecraft Country. It's about a young man named Atticus who returns home um, after his father has gone missing. And um, he goes on a quest to bring his father back home with his uncle George, with his friend, Letty Lewis. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember the log line. <laughs> like, you do great. I don't want to give away <laughs> But really, it's a show. It's a, a a family drama. It taps into so many themes um, that we get to explore about who we are, who we were as a nation, who we are now. We were in Jim Crow America in 1955. Um, it's a show about family in search of family. Um, anybody else want to chime in? How'd I do? And how the themes <laughs> of what happened back then are still going on today. Uh, and what, Courtney what B. Vance, that's that an road. excellent tea up. Mm -hmm. That is something I want to talk to you all about. But there's just one piece of business I want to get out of the way. My very favorite thing, perhaps, in the pilot is you and Anjanu at the very top of this pilot, giving us grown-up Black love. That yes. brings me so much joy. <laughs> oh, yes? That it was, truly that was, does. That was, Anjanu, that was fun. That was a fun scene, huh? Yes, that was a that was a fun, sweaty Chicago summertime scene. Hot fun in the summertime, huh? Uh, yes. If, if yes, I could concur on that, I actually I, I bought that up. Um, so I I, uh, I bought that up last night with uh, I called them Journey, and mm -hmm. I said Journey, you know, there's really something special about the scene with um with with Courtney and Ajinu. I said it's the level of black love you know, the spooning and, and when she when she looks over her shoulder with that smile and he's holding her, man, it is there is something so beautiful about that and, and I agree, it's just grown black love and it was beautiful. You guys I literally just mentioned that last night to Journey. He did. He did. It was so beautiful. And both it's of you such a hot, okay. Yes, sexy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's such a warm place to start. It was hot. It was hot in Chicago. It was hot. <laughs> it was hot and it was hot. But it's such a warm place to start the show from that goes into some pretty dark corners from there. And I thought it was a really sort of good foundation to begin from. And so I want to talk to Courtney Journey and Jonathan for a moment about sort of the start of this journey that you were on to find Michael Kay's character. And that Courtney, am I, am I right in thinking that your character is sort of writing a version of the Green Book, essentially, as uh, that is his business? He's a, a jack of all trades in that uh, um, and we all have to, back in the day, black in the day, we had to do several things to make ends meet. And he, he does do that, but it's a family affair. Um, uh, that's, that's part of what my wife and I are discussing in the, in the midst of our black love is uh, um, that uh, Miss Anjanu wants to go. And it's an ongoing discussion that we have uh, about the dangers of the road. Um, and, um, but, but it is also, you know, that she is, 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 is as talented, if not more so than I am in terms of writing these stories. And uh, um, it, it, it just, it's, it, it's a precursor to what is to come in terms of, uh, our relationship and uh, and also our, our daughter being a part of it as well. So there's a whole rhythm and flow, right, Anjanu? Yeah, um, we, maybe we should talk a little bit about what the Green Book um, was and is. You go ahead. So so the Green Book was this manual that, um, that 
was used by um, um, black folks, black citizens um, that gave an outline places that it was safe, safe to go to eat, safe to uh, go um, uh, vacation, restaurants, hotels, places that were open to them in, in, in segregationist America. So um, our family um, um, was involved in, in you know, preparing that information that unfortunately black people had to have during that time so they would know where they would be safe when they would be traveling across the country. So that's what the Green Book is. And that we and, are actually going out to help uh, continue the, and to map out new areas, new territories, yes? Right, right, yeah. And so, so. Journey, your character essentially hitches a ride. Uh, mm -hmm. She is ready to get out of town uh, for you and Wumi, maybe not the, the, um, the best relationship. <laughs> this is the other family in the show. Can you talk about uh, you all's relationship a little bit and why you decide to set off on this journey after seeing her in Chicago? Right, well, Letty has just returned home after leaving home in search of her home. Um, and she's cr traveled across the country documenting as a photographer the protests and being a part of this budding civil rights movement. But, you know, she returns home and is very much so estranged from her family, didn't attend her mother's funeral. And there is this animosity that this real resentment that exists between the sisters, Ruby and Letty. Um, you know, Letty is very much so this disruptor, this defiant woman who's trying to find her tribe and didn't find it in her home. And Ruby kind of looks at me at Letty as like a up, you know, and Letty's tired of being looked up, looked as a up. Um, and yet I need her. It's so hard for me to not talk in first person when I talk about it. <laughs> and yet Letty needs Ruby um, and has always looked to Ruby as somewhat of a maternal figure because their mother wasn't able to be that stable maternal figure in either of their lives. And um, Ruby's not really having it when, I, when she comes back home. You know, she won't, won't let her stay with her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's kind of ruthless, Ruby. Like, she don't play. And yet yeah. she loves Letty. She, exactly. she is so loving and so giving. And um, it, it was a beautiful relationship to explore this sisterhood. Um, you know, one sister who's so stable and one sister who's so... Unstable. You know, <laughs> yes, so unstable. But you have so, something great in common, though. You have this musical connection. And I'm, I'm guessing that as actresses, that was a wonderful sort of common area to have, right? Our rehearsals were a lot of fun, Ruby. They were a lot of fun. But it's funny because I don't think either of us really think of ourselves as musical. We were both a little bit shy at the beginning, but it definitely was a bonding experience. It was fun. I loved it. Does anybody else believe that they were shy? You guys are so wonderful in this scene where you're performing. There's no residue of shyness anywhere. I think fun. for me, it was like a different, like, vocal genre than I, that I was ever used to. And like, you know, be, you know, being the kind of person who's free to improvise with a band, that's not me. I was like in a choir and, you know, one, two, three, four, not off the beat, <laughs> you know, <laughs> had to sound like the other girls. And like trying to find that vocal identity and individuality. And then also as having to find that kind of um, vibing together as sisters, like that you, you, that you believe that they grew up together and did these dances together. And, you know, it was fun. And we needed those rehearsals to kind of establish that kind of physical, vocal familiarity. And the guitar as well. Oh, the guitar. This bad boy. Love <laughs> I love it, though, but it gives you a sense of connection between the <laughs> two of you. And then she promptly abandoned you to go off with these gentlemen to have right. this adventure. And I love that all three of these characters are sci-fi people, um, are Lovecraft people, are, are sort of 
oddly prepared for what they're about to see, although no one's prepared to see real monsters, right? But they are people that are interested in this genre. And there's something that I just love about in a genre where the black person is always the first person that gets killed, <laughs> that we have this black family <laughs> that like is at the center of it, that is like going to look after it. And I'm curious where any of you horror people before or sci-fi people before uh, taking on this project? I was a huge fan of the Twilight Zone, uh, which kind of uh, reminds me of the Lovecraft world, the um, the socially charged mixed with the bizarre. Um, so, you know, I liked things like that. I, and I did, I loved my uh, Friday the 13th and Freddy Krueger's, but um, uh, uh, this was, um, this is a great mixture. This was a, a very good reminder of Twilight Zone and particularly for me. And Jonathan, I'm curious for your character who is um, the most into that and is sort of, we are going through your POV on this adventure and him talking about adventure at the beginning. And this not normally being the way we see this adventure. When you read the script for the first time, I'm curious what your reaction was. Were you immediately hooked? Did it take you a while to get in? My first read, I think I read it twice back to back when I first got it because I was uh, in many ways amazed that this was written. You know, I was like, well, how is, and he's a black guy? Alec is black? That's the, that's the guy? That's who we're following. Um, and what has happened in the writing and in the, and in the making of it with Atticus and, and with everybody, you kind of get to explore not just the archetypical ideas of uh, what we tend to play. You know, he's not just this soldier, right? That's pretty common, right? But he's also a bibliophile. Um, he also gets to uh, travel. He's an adventurer. He has all these ideas. You know, he's a strong body. He's a strong mind. He's a strong heart. And so all that was very apparent to me in the, uh, in the reading of the, of the script. You know, all the connections. You know, you look for the character, who he's connected to. You know, the idea where it's, you know, fatherhood and what it is to be a son and what it is to be a black son and what it is to grow up in a black community at a time where, you know, that was a very uh, unexplored area. You know, we didn't have any stories about that. You know, when we first meet Atticus, where, um, you know, he's reading a uh, Edgar Hughes, uh, uh, Edgar Burroughs um, a book, you know, he's a Lovecraftian bibliophile, you know, that's not commonplace. So, uh, so no, it didn't take me much to, to know, like, yeah, it's on to sign right on. And Michael, so you are central in the sense that you are the person that these guys are seeking. They're coming after you, so we don't see you at first. So there's a, there's a sense of mystery to your character because you are an idea that they talk about, but not a physical presence right away. And I'm curious if that kind of thing, sort of knowing a little bit of backstory of how you're perceived by the other characters informs the way you play the character that you have to make a certain kind of entrance. There were so many things that um, I was focused on. That I, I, um, how Montrose was um, going to make his entrance, that, that didn't uh, uh, occur to me. However, it was in the, um, his response to turning around and seeing his family, that was interesting to me. For him to take that note, that made me want to explore who he was in, in that moment, why? Right, that they have come for him and yet, but that's part of the mystery, right? That is, <laughs> these are the things that we don't know. And speaking of yeah. mystery, I mean, we don't see, you are another person that we don't see a lot of right at the beginning. And I don't want to spoil anything about your character. So is there, what do you feel comfortable sharing with the audience out there and sort of describing how your character fits into the story? Yeah, um, so she's the um, the only daughter of a, um, a leader of an, a secret uh, order called the Sons of Adam, who are natural philosophers, alchemists. She's the the ultimate provocateur, you know, the the agent of chaos. I'm the the white antagonist. Um, I think that she represents on a larger scale, sort of the oppressed 1950s woman sort of liberating herself from the patriarchal society and and um family that she's been brought up in and all the while doing it with her her white privilege you know so she's the uh she's the karen the karen type 
character that we hear about today, you know? But she has a war. Yeah, sorry, But she also has a war with herself, too. It's not, I mean, it is not a simple thing, your character. No, and that's, and I think that was what was the most challenging part about Christina is that if she was just a violent, manipulative, um, nasty uh, woman, it would have been in a lot of ways an, an easier role to approach. But the challenge and the conflict came in that she was so deeply human and and relatable, universally relatable in that she was herself oppressed, damaged, abused, um, neglected, lonely, just trying to get her needs met um, in very questionable ways, um, pretty awful ways, but she still was just a woman trying to get her needs met. She was essentially looking for the same thing that all the other characters are looking for, a, a family, um, liberation, justice, revenge, um, uh, independence, love. So, yeah, it was a very, it was a very confronting sort of role to be taking on. It was, um, it was disturbing. <laughs> well, time. and I want to follow up on that a little bit and ask mm-hmm. you all and about the, one of the really interesting things to me about what I've seen this so far is there certainly is a, a heaviness to some of this, that you are dealing with human monsters, you are dealing with scary monsters in the woods, but there are also moments, and again, not to spoil anything, but there's one moment in particular I'm thinking of where there's great joy, there's, there's humor, and there's something, again, to go back to the black love thing to me that is so enriching to me that in a story like this, that does involve black pain, that there is also black joy, which is not something we always see in a story like this. And I'm curious about how you balance those vibes on the set, I guess, as a way, because I'm sure there were some days that were probably kind of heavy. Well, I think it's it's innate to human beings and it's very particular to the African-American experience. I mean, you we wouldn't be here now if we couldn't find the levity in the humor um in humanity you know in black folks we just have a way of you know we're full we're full human beings where there's sorrow there's joy you know and i think i mean just this cast we're tight all of us extremely tight i mean we have made a family you know there were days where we go crazy on set and it'd be crazy and then it'd be fun and then we'd be you know crying about this and this and then crying about this and this and this and then shooting the shot you know um and so it's um not to speak for the cast, but for me, it felt extremely natural. You know, it felt like we was at home. You know, I still have a hard time calling Courtney B. Vance, Courtney B. Vance. He's Uncle George. <laughs> Michael K. Williams is Pop. You know, Letty, etc. Auntie, you know, Ruby. Christina. Actually, I never I never really say Christina because I don't really say a name much. But, you know, Christina, I, you know, that's who they are to us. We, we were such a family. So the ecosystem was that of, you know, culture, up, down, you know, whatever it takes. You can't make art, you know, you know, with a sad face. I think I think that has a lot to do and a lot to say about the person who's not here, which is uh, Misha Green, um, the world that uh, she she set up uh, uh, with us uh, from the pilot and all, all the way through through the shooting of it and surrounding us with those people that can that can make us help us become uh, a family. Uh, and we we become family on and on every set for you know for uh, good reasons and for not so good reasons when things don't go well um, when we don't have uh, appropriate uh, leadership or behavior we uh, we become tighter you know or or the opposite can happen we can just the cast can fracture but you know there were challenges on on our set as in on all sets and we we became tighter, um, you know. So I'm, I'm, I was, I'm always um, so wonderfully uh, impressed uh, about the the organized chaos of a set. I mean, it, it's just you know, how this, how the family happens when you don't know nobody, you know, and you got to mm-hmm. do an intimate scene on the first day. <laughs> you know, how does how does Michael K and I, you know, we. We we met each other, you know, uh, maybe two three months. I don't know. Was it a year before Michael K in, in New Jersey? And that was you, a couple of months. Before. A couple of months before, and yeah. all of a sudden we're doing this scene, 
and we're like in the scene and it's the most beautiful thing you know we, the two of us are like where did this come from? you know that's that's the beauty i i always say that actors are the most courageous people courageous people because we got to jump in you know uh, jazz musicians got to jump in you know it's the same same stuff I'm kind of amazed that you two didn't know each other before this. You had never even met. You know, of each other. I, I'm a huge fan of Michael Case. Courtney and I, we had met um, uh, like a couple of months. Well, we we had met a long time ago in, in LA at a, at a at one of the parties, the the, uh, the award parties, and you know, I I walked. I think I freaked him out because um, I, maybe it's why he's blanketed, but I quoted almost every line from um, the People versus OJ with him as as um Cochran, and it, you know, and then um. We 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 were on we were being um honored at, a, at an event in Jersey, uh like about a month or two before we had to film, and you know the first day of work was a um we can't give it away but it was a needless to say it was a very emotional a uh, very emotional um scene, and I think that was the first day for me that the family started to to bond so that 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 thing started to happen for me it was a journey jonathan uh george and, and i um very difficult scene emotionally a lot of heavy lifting and when the cameras when the directors yell cut we couldn't stop we, it just it just all this emotion it was just so much energy on the set and that was the that that day i knew that i was around family that is so great. And Journey, I wanted to ask you specifically, and Jonathan too, about uh, there is a scene in the pilot that is very tense that involves the police and sort of trying to get out of a sundown town, uh, mm -hmm. essentially. Which I think that there are going to be people who watch this that don't know what sundown towns are, which is sort of amazing to me, but I think is true. Um, and so just for people that might not know what it is, a sundown town was a town where Black people needed to get out of town before sundown or that they were fair game essentially to be killed. Um, and so there is this scene where that is a threat. And that's the kind of thing I'm thinking of when you shoot that scene, sort of, is there an exhaustion after something like that? Is there an exhilaration from getting through it? What is sort of the feeling of shooting something like that? I, I think, you know, um, it is tough because they're without, going into any spoilers, there are so many themes that we explore in this show that resonate with us as being Black Americans in 2020, right? You know, and unfortunately, as we're seeing, you know, sometimes our police departments are what Angeles Davis calls one of the most dramatic examples of structural racism. And, you know, um, tapping into that energy, is, it's a very dark place to go to um just in general tapping into the systemic racism that our nation's been built upon it is um of course a dark place to go to but it's necessary you know this story is one of my teachers refers to it as a blood memory you know yeah. that it's it's something that reverberates through our dna this visceral connection to the oppression of our people and these that's why these stories we're still telling them. Um, and so, yes, when, when you tap into those stories, like we are tapping into in Lovecraft, um, whether it's this scene or like I say, without giving away spoilers, there's a familiar um, emotion that it brings up for sure. Um, and, but, but again, having family, you know, we had each other, right? And that's the thing about this show. I do not know how I would have survived this show. And I hand to God, do not know how I would have survived it without having my brothers and my sisters in arms, you know, um, having, you know, doing scenes like that. And I'm looking and it's, it's Atticus and it's Uncle George or in scenes when it's Montrose or, you know, my, my sisters, it, 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 it helps you have the strength um, to tackle these stories, you know? Yeah. And they are important stories to tackle too. And it's such an interesting time for this to be happening. Um, you bring up a point that I feel like it's, it's something that a lot of people 
that we're talking about now, that we're talking about generational trauma and the idea that you can go back to a time and yet feel that even though we are looking backwards, we are not as far from that moment as we might hope we'd be um, as a country. And there was no way for anyone involved with this to know that it would be coming out in this moment that this is happening. And there's a part of me that believes that this is very useful. And I, I don't want to put anybody in the position of saying what you're doing is important because I understand this is television and it is not policy. But I personally believe that this is important in terms of the conversation. And I'm curious how you all feel about a show at least being a conversation starter. So I grew up in Texas, you know, and literally on the top of my script, I wrote, worst day in Texas. This is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you as a young black man in Texas. You're in the car with your girl and your dad or your girl and your uncle, you know, you're driving around and the cops pull you over. Now, the interesting thing, when I was growing up, I mean, I'm you know, still growing up, but when I, was, when I was a boy down in Texas driving, couldn't nobody watch that. Couldn't nobody see that. Hmm. The white folks would drive on by, even other brothers and sisters would drive on by and say, hey, you know, hope you, hope you, you know, yes sir, no sir, your way out of it. You know what I mean? And so to take this story, to take that moment, and for you to even mention it now, it lets me know, lets us know that it resonated with you. You know, it is something that is ancient, you know, that systematic racism, that, that, that bullying, you know, as Journey so beautifully stated. But now it's on TV, you know, and you notice in that scene, it's just people, you understand? The, the demonic spirit that's entering in is that of, you know, racism, et cetera. You know, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're showing, you know, in technicolor, you know, and so many folks don't see that. So many people keep driving by, you know, so they see that they're connected to these three characters in this moment. They now understand to a certain degree what it is it feels like, you know, the unfairness of it. Yes. You know? So you can say it's not policy, but it is important. You know, okay. uh, it's also entertainment, and that's 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 I think what what you're talking about is that at what point do you? Because we've seen these scenes, Jonathan, Journey, and Michael, and everyone. We've seen these scenes where the the black men or black women, then you think you can, you hope you can, yes sir, yes ma'am, your way out of the situation, and you you you. We all see them. The question is, what at what point is that going to be enough? Enough of that? That 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 kind of behavior, that that kind of bullying is not appropriate anymore and we shouldn't see it anymore. It shouldn't be, oh, here comes that scene. It shouldn't be, we shouldn't see that anymore. It should be like an outdated, that's an old movie. The police are coming up to the black man and, and the black woman and bullying them. At what point, and that's what I think where we are as a society, we're, we're, we're at that point where, where we could go either way that we're going to say those kinds of scenes are not going to happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of situations where the, 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 the headlock and I can't breathe all those kinds of situations where the bullying happens, be the, the Karen situation, all those kinds of situations. I'm sick of it. I'm, and I know we're all sick of seeing it and, and I'm, I'm sick of, of, of seeing it. And then, and we all have to go, Oh, well, that's just the way it goes. I know. Come on. Daddy, that's not right. I know, baby. I know. But we're going to get through this together. Come on. Daddy, didn't that just happen last week or, or two weeks ago? We saw uh, Trayvon. And then we said, I know, baby. I know. But we're going to get that kind of white folks don't have to do that with their children. They don't have to do that. And at what point do, do we even white folks go? That's they shouldn't have to say those kind of, kind of conversations. With, I was, I'm in this white area in where we live and somebody, that I came out my door at midnight and I heard a noise, I came out and there was police all around my, this white area, police in my front yard talking about, come out the house with your hands up. I'm in my midnight, my children, three years old, sleep in the house and I get put on my knees on the ground because they, they got a call to somebody. Now, if it was a white person that, that opened the door, they, they would assume the person lived there. But I'm a black person and I get, and I've seen enough law and orders to know, don't you say a word, Courtney, come out the house with your hands up in the air and get on your knees. And I said, I live here, ma'am, quietly. I live here. She was shouting at the top of her lungs midnight 
in this quiet little white area because I said, yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm just letting you know I'm live here. My, my wallet's inside. If you want to, you want me to go and get it or you want to go in and get it? My children sleep. They're three. Okay. And finally, there was a sister, police officer. There was seven of them out there. She said, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Mr. Vance, I'm so sorry. Here's my badge number. If you need my number, here's my, I basically, she said, I ain't got nothing to do with this. I, I'm just letting you know. So at what point do, that's that's enough that you don't, that, that there's a different rule for white people and black people. There's a different law. There's a different way of that. And, and there's an unwritten rule for police that if it's a, if it's a black person, you, you, you treat them differently than if it's a white person, you kid glove them. And it's so clear. And at what point are we all going to say that's enough now? You, everybody's got to be treated the same when they, until they got to reprogram the, the police. Well, and I, I'm hoping that that is what, this moment is. I mean, I had an interaction with a cop two weeks ago that was not great. And I'm sure everybody on here has had multiple interactions that have been less than good. But, um, but hopefully that's what this moment's about, right? And so I'm curious, I, I feel like there's a through line here between showing this in this moment that you all are depicting and what is happening now and actually it helping to change things that like, good, good Lord, how long are we putting up with this? If I can add to that too. Um, and aside from just leaving the responsibility to change in the hands of our law enforcement officers, I would like to get back to the aspect of what Abby said earlier, the, the Karen aspect. Um, I remember last year, my brother and a few of my friends and I, we had went to go eat dinner um, at a little chicken spot on, on 14th Street and 1st Avenue. And um, next thing we know, halfway through our dinner, uh, about four or five police officers come into the restaurant. And apparently, um, a white woman had misplaced her phone or lost it. And when she pinged it, it got pinged to this restaurant. This is a little, you know, walk in sit grab your chicken and you sit down and you do your thing it's not a you know it's not five star you, you know the there is something wrong with the fact that she did not feel safe to come into that restaurant and just ask us have you seen my phone the fear the white fear you, you know it's real she 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 was enabled because of what she has been conditioned to see when she see black skin, to come and just ask us for her phone. Did we see her phone? She thought the only way to deal with that was to call the police on us. Mm. And just like uh, Courtney talked about, you know, um, I, I went into beast mode. I instructed everyone at the table to not say one word. Mm. And I was the only one to do talking. And, um, I, you, you know, they do this thing where they, start to pry while they're talking nice to you. And um, it was this whole thing. So where were you at before you got here? And I said, with all due respect, officer, that's none of your business. Um, we're here now having dinner. Can I help you? And, um, you know, that was, the, that was the, the, the narrative and the conversation. And it was frightening. But I, I knew to not, I, I didn't want any of my family members or my friends getting emotional. So I knew to take the lead and to speak and to speak with a calm, but, but um, a firm hand. And once they started to recognize me, that's when the old shit happened and they realized, and then the whole tone changed. And that was insult to injury. Yeah. It, it, so you mean because I would, I, you, you, it, it was, I would rather have, I would have rather them it would have been better to say, okay, we know who you are, but we still need to search you for her phone. But because now you recognize me from my job, that everything goes away. What would have happened to my brother and my friends had I not been there? Yeah. So when we talk about the Karen as aspect of it, I, I feel, I, 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 it hurts, you know, I feel that I am having, I try to have empathy for white fear. I don't know what it is that make people frightened of the color of, our, of skin. And um, that's part of the problem. We, you know, we need to also acknowledge that it's not just it's it's all it's all part of the problem. 
Well, and that's the thing. It is, it, and that is where sort of representation and the work that you do in Hollywood, going back to the earlier point, is useful. That people can see this, people can have conversations, people, it's a jumping off point. And it's interesting because in this show you have, again, human monsters, but then you have sort of real monsters. And, and it's interesting that, that we need to have metaphorical monsters in this situation. And I'm curious about sort of the, those monsters that are the fantastical sci-fi monsters, do they sort of represent something else to any of your of you all in the context of this show, as opposed to the sort of humanity monstrousness that we see? Well, it did for me when I, uh, I the, the um, as Montrose is not in the pilot, but I was I was I was you know able to read it, grateful, and um, that was you know that was the first thing that 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 spoke to me. The monsters represented everything that is dark and vile in society. That's what the monsters represented to me um, in the first reading of the pilot. And just for you all that actually had to interact with the monsters, I'm curious that the, on a much, much lighter note, the sort of green screen and the horror face <laughs> and all of that stuff, is that stuff fun? Or is it just like a technical, logistical, like marks you gotta hit? That's silly. Because you're not it's seeing silly. anything. <laughs> to me, it's silly. It's real silly. And we're all, ah. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> we we just be silly. I just enjoy uh, my time with um, my brothers and my sisters being silly because that's you know what we're we have to. We're, now where's the monster at? The monster's over there. Where are you looking, John? Journey, where are you looking? Are you looking down? Or are you looking up? Are you looking at that tree? You, look, <laughs> it's, you know, we just being silly and trying to keep the bugs off of us and just trying to. <laughs> Oh, it, it's also a, uh, a different muscle to exercise because it just requires so much imagination. You know, it requires you to really just play. Um, but unlike anything I've ever done before, it was it was definitely a different experience because there's the technical stuff, the technical side, as Courtney is saying, you know, the wind blowing or the, what was the stuff, the spit that Misha really wanted to blow on us? They couldn't get it right, Jonathan? Viscous or, or, or something like the yeah. yeah. <laughs> it probably spent like a wasted a good hour trying to get that right. Yeah, it sounds sticky and maybe not that pleasant, but uh, but there's a lot going on here, and I think people are really gonna enjoy it. I mean, this combination of like storytelling is so great. So if somebody had to pitch people, so we're at a place where we're talking to folks out there. What's your pitch? Watch Lovecraft Country because? Come on, y'all. You're actors. <laughs> Give me a pitch. <laughs> Jonathan. Uncle George. Because watch Lovecraft Country because it is so different and so engaging. And it'll, especially during this time period we're living in now, it is, uh, it is you know, you thought you had something going on with, with Game of Thrones, but watch out. We got something on Game of Thrones and, and Work of Thrones and <laughs> we work in our throne. This is going to be something that you ain't never seen before. That's what I like to hear. All right. We are actually, I can't believe it, already out of time. So I can't thank you all enough for being here and being part of this conversation today. And thank you to everybody who's out there watching and listening. And we are going to show you a little more sneak peek of Lovecraft Country, which is premiering on HBO on August 16th. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is definitely a door. Spread out. See if you can find a way to open it. Turn off your flashlights. Huh? I said turn them off, damn it!
journey to the center of the earth type You see Titus's pages? I see three tunnels! Beware all ye who tread the path. Ever the tide shall rise. <laughs> <laughs>